Hello and welcome to another Fantasy Premier League video. My name is Steve and I am sitting on a very healthy green arrow this week as I absolutely creamed the captaincy which has sent me all the way back up to an overall rank of just inside the top 51k overall. Uh, but there is a huge fixture swing uh, coming up between game weeks 9 and 10 with a larger than usual number of premium teams with amazing fixtures upcoming. And so I thought we'd do a little bit of a recap of what we've seen in game week 8, uh, heading into the international break. This will be the only video this week, so it's a bit of a, I don't know, a marker in the sand to make sure that we get all the ideas out so that when we come back to it, in about a week's time to make whatever transfers that we may need to make uh, from any injuries that do arise out of the international break. Uh, thought that would be a good idea. So <clears throat> game week eight, there was a lot of managers pulling the wildcard chip, which is actually a pretty perfect time to be jumping on the wildcard as the fixture swings coming up are quite massive and are going to be very pivotal uh, for this season as there are about seven big teams like decent teams that have got some very good fixtures upcoming and so we need to make sure that we jump on the correct teams and try to avoid those teams that end up being banana peels. Uh, but before we jump into it, <clears throat> if you're not already a subscriber of this channel, consider subscribing. It really does help the channel out. And if you enjoy the following content, make sure that you hit that like button. So, game week eight, we'll go through a bit of a review first. I scored 65 points with an average of 44. Uh, I started the game week on 130k, or just outside the 130k. And the score of 65 has taken me, well, it's 61 actually, because I made three transfers uh, for a minus four point hit. It is the second time I have taken a hit this season. And it is actually, I'm actually two for two in terms of green arrows uh, when taking hits. So I last took a hit in game week six. Uh, where I scored 98 points minus the four, which actually took me up to 56k. Uh, and then I took another hit just two game weeks later in game week eight, as you can see on screen here, which has sent me back up into the top 50k overall. So my hits seem to be working out very well uh, at the moment. So the transfers that I made it was actually a pretty easy decision to take the hit this week. Uh, I had a Stupin and Botman and, Botman and Saka uh, in my teams. I knew a Stupin and was out for a while. Botman is coming back hopefully game week 9, maybe game week 10. And Saka was deemed in contention by Arteta, which I think was just uh, a way of saying... Well, it's a way of not saying that he was definitely out, even though he looked like he was probably definitely going to be out. He didn't want to afford any advantage to Pep, um, as Pep would have definitely needed to have some plans in place uh, if Saka was indeed going to play. So you've got to have, you've got to listen to what the managers are saying and try to read through the lines there. But I sold Saka as well. Uh, and the three newbies that I brought in didn't score particularly well. I bought an Udogi, Udogi for his clean sheet, which is all well and good. Cash, who blanked uh, with his two points, and Luis Diaz, who also blanked with his two points. But considering the three players that I sold all scored zero points for game week eight, the ten points... Uh, for my three new players, minus the four points, gave me a net six-point gain, which helped contribute uh, to the big green arrow. Uh, the main reason that I've actually done so well here is, like I said in the intro, I have absolutely smashed the captaincy here. Uh, we actually got quite lucky. Um, 
for a few reasons. I will go into those in a second. But Salah was the second top point scorer for game week eight. Was only one point behind Sterling. Uh, who was the highest scoring player of game week eight, but he was not in anybody's captaincy thoughts. The main captains for the week were Salah, Haaland and Son, with some people talking about Madison a little bit, but I think that would have been, if it was between Madison and Haaland, I think I probably still would have landed at Haaland. Uh, And so with Haaland blanking with two points, Sun blanking with three points, and Salah coming away with 15 points, it is just a huge captaincy call. Uh, And we actually did get a little bit lucky there, as I think Sun could have actually came away with the points here. So... I came out with the right result on the call of Sun uh, because he did end up blanking, but it did not at all play out the way that I thought it would. So in the video last week, I said that I expected Luton to put up a pretty low block against um, Spurs, and I wasn't entirely sure how Sun was going to adapt to the congested space he would find himself in. However, when I watched the game, Luton didn't at all play a low block in that match. Or if they were trying to play a a low block, they didn't at all implement it successfully. At all. (laughs) I mean, (coughs) excuse me, there was way too much space afforded to Sun. Madison, Saar and Basuma in the middle of the park. Sun was always in quite a bit of space he had managed to find three to four yards around uh, the men that were marking him Uh, and he could have easily been found by teammates in a few situations but it was more that just the teammates weren't actually finding Sun when he had found those pockets of space so Luton actually lined up in what looked like a 4-4-2 formation which is an incredibly ambitious formation to attempt against a very quality team like Spurs, who were always going to have an overload in the middle of the park, playing in a 4-2-3-1 formation. So the 4-2-3-1 comes with three central midfielders, uh, usually two CDMs, and a cam, which uh, Madison has been playing in. But Madison doesn't really play the typical cam-type role. He quite often drops deep to help um, overload the midfield uh, anyway. But with Luton playing a 4-4-2, they actually only really had two central men in the middle of the park. And uh, Madison, Basuma and Saar absolutely destroyed the middle of the park Uh, especially in that first half when they had 11 men on the pitch. They were just breezing through the lines. Within about seven minutes, actually, I wrote down some team notes here. Oh, some fiction notes, sorry. I'll just jump up to it. It It's seven minutes into the game, and I wrote, seven minutes in, it should already be 3-0. Three massive chances missed, two by Richarlison and one by Porro. Spurs look like they're going to destroy Luton. And a big part of that was the formation that they lined up in. 4-4-2, I don't know what. In fact, I don't even know who the manager of Luton is. I don't know what the hell he was thinking when he decided to try and do that. But it was made way too easy for Spurs. So when Basuma got sent off... uh, Definite two yellow cards. I don't know what he was doing on the second one. Uh, he had an absolute brain fart there. But at half time, what Postacoglu did is he took Richarlison off. And I think he took Richarlison off because he it was looking like the weakest attacker on the pitch. He should have scored those first two goals. He was making some poor decisions, poor shot selection, wasn't quite there. So I wasn't at all surprised that he got subbed off. And for any of you that are considering Richarlison, he is a hard no-go for me. You will have to get very lucky for him to come away with a goal. And you will probably only be afforded some sort of assists from him if he lays the ball off to someone like a Madison or Son. Uh, But when he took 
Richarlison off, he replaced him with Hoiberg, <laughs> which basically meant that he left a doge out on the left wing to just look after, he just basically played a wing back to look after left back and left wing spot. Udogi worked his absolute ass off on the pitch. He was up and down that left hand side uh, all game. He did very well covering uh, for the extra man that they did not have. And Postacogli just put Hoiberg in the middle of the pitch to make sure that they still had that extra man overload. And it basically looked like that Spurs were playing with 11 v 11, as you couldn't really see the overloads on the pitch. Luton was still playing that 4 4 2 formation. Postacoglu, just tactically aware, made sure that he overran the middle of the pitch. And as soon as uh, Spurs scored that one goal, he probably said at half time, look, when we score this one goal, we're then just going to shut the game down because Luton don't have the quality to score a goal. And as long as we keep the ball off them, we should be fine. And that is basically the game plan that he went with. So Sun was subbed off early as expected. We also got very lucky in the captaincy here in that, you know, Spurs actually went down to 10 men. I think if they kept 11 men on the pitch, uh, Sun would have probably picked up some more opportunities in that second half before he was subbed off. But he was again subbed off at the 76 minute mark, meaning that the captaincy uh, being thrown to Sun is pretty... Well, it's not really exploiting the captaincy chip as much as you could because, you know, there's about 25 to 30 minutes, including extra time at the end of uh, the second half, that you will be missing out on. And it is those times when, that, that time of the game, where, you know, a team like Spurs would have usually worn down their opposition, especially the opposition that isn't quite at their level. And so... We did predict that Sun was going to come off early, and that's another reason why we went to um, back Sulla instead. But what was actually quite surprising is that Postacoglu also took Madison off at the 76 minute, minute mark at the same time that he bought Sun off. Now this, I think, was just straight tactics. I don't think there's anything wrong with Madison. Um, I think he was just saying, look, we're up 1-0. I don't think Luton are going to be able to break us down. We'll take off our two attackers and he brought on Oliver Skip and Emerson Royale who are two obviously defensively minded players and asked Kulusevski to play that solo position up front which I actually think he did extremely well. He's very good at holding the ball up, very good at getting out to the wings and slowing the play down so that the rest of his teammates could come up and join him so that they could maintain possession in Luton's own half. And I think he did exactly what Postacoglu would have probably asked him of uh, asked of him of him at half time. Now this does actually make Kulisiski a bit of a better FPL option moving forward, as I don't see uh, Sun making it to the 90 minutes anytime soon and so when he is subbed off I suspect he will use Kulisewski in that number nine role again for the final moments of the match which does add another string to his bow. So continuing on with the review Johnston <coughs> has been absolutely key to my success so far this season. He's now joint top of the goalkeepers on 38 points and is a super differential as he is only owned by 2.3% of the game. <clears throat> now with Crystal Palace finding it difficult to score, the def def defence is actually lapping up all the bonus points. So Anderson and Johnston are doing very well on the bonus points uh, when Crystal Palace do in fact keep a clean sheet. And Johnston is kind of like the Pope of a few seasons ago, where he is fielding quite a, lo quite a lot of shots. Most of them are low XG shots from outside the box, and so he is also getting those save points, which again helps him in this bonus point structure. In the last three game weeks, he has earned five bonus points. So he got two this week, two the week before, and one the week before that. 
in three back-to-back -back clean sheets in which I have managed to actually gobble up all those points. I did in fact play Johnston over Turner in the Manchester United away fixture in game week seven and he is the uber differential that is actually really helping boost my rank at the moment and I have no plans to sell Johnston even down to Areola in order to fund some moves. I think he is probably the prime goalkeeper asset in the game at the moment. Uh, Luis Diaz, my new purchase for the week, had a mixed game. Uh, there were a few things that didn't quite go right for him in the early stages of the game. There were some misplaced passes, um, some ball controls that he didn't quite bring under control, which had him losing position a couple of times in the match. But the positions that he was taking up on the pitch were central and very dangerous. He was playing on the last man and was only ever really marked by one person. So he, if he was ever found, he was usually always in a one-on-one -on -one situation uh, and was actually in the box very centrally as well at the end of Liverpool's attacks. But similarly to like, to Sun in the Spurs game, Diaz wasn't ever really found uh, by his teammates. There was um, a ball that was delivered across the box that ended up at Gravenberch's feet. It's the shot that he took that ended up hitting the crossbar or the post. I think it was the crossbar. Uh, and Luis Diaz was actually sitting smack bang central in the goal and probably had a very decent goal scoring opportunity if he was able to be found by his teammate but the ball didn't quite land to him. So on the stats, he probably was reflected very well. Yeah, so his XG for the game was 0.12 with an XA of 0.05 because the ball never really actually made it to him. But he was in the right spots. All he needed was for his teammates to deliver the ball to his feet. He's got a home game to Everton this week, which I think has a very high potential upside for him. And given that Saka's injury, so I sold Saka for Luis Diaz, and I'm holding on to the money uh, for uh, to buy Saka straight back. So I've got 1.1 million in the bank, which is those exact funds to get Luis Diaz back up to Saka at 8.6 million. Fingers crossed that Saka does drop down to 8.5 million so that I can have 0.1 million in the bank after that purchase but I have no plans to buy Saka back in game week 9 uh, because well given that Saka's injury kept him out of the Champions League match he was subbed off early he's now missed the crucial Man City fixture and has made him unavailable for the national squad, there is no way that I'm going to risk buying him in game week 9, even if he is leaked to be starting. I would like to see him get 90 minutes under his belt, not come off the pitch, not come off hobbling, look like he is over that injury, which I'm hoping the two-week international break will um, help him get him back to health. So Diaz will be in the team uh, for game week nine. It's a really good run, uh, game to Everton. And if we do find out that Saka's injury is going to hold him out for a little bit longer than what Arteta has been leading, on, uh, leading us on to believe, uh, Diaz has Nottingham Forest at home in game week 10, Luton away in game week 11, and Brentford at home in game week 12. Those are three really good attacking fixtures after the Everton game. So if we do, um, if we aren't able to buy Saka back, I will just hold on to that money in the bank and continue to play Diaz in my team as 9.5% differential. I think he is the best Liverpool asset to own besides Salah, uh, but I will go into a little bit more detail on Liverpool as we touch on the fixture swings. Now Jota is also back from suspension in game week 9 though so there is a little bit more con competition for Diaz but considering how Diaz is playing I know he had a couple of bumps at the start of the game at the weekend but on the whole he actually had a pretty good game. I don't see too much rotation risk from Jota. Uh, and I do think Diaz is a far superior option on the left and given 
Klopp's actions in the past, specifically that Wolves game where he brought uh, Leo Diaz on to completely change the game around, which he did. I think that has still secured him as the first choice left winger in that Liverpool lineup. So that's pretty much it for the game week review. Madison picked up an assist and basically everybody else blinked. Uh, we'll just look forward to game week nine. So the team lining up at the moment is looking really strong. Every single player in my starting 11 has a home fixture this week. I'll be starting Turner and Net at home to Luton, which is about as banker of a clean sheet as you could probably get in the Premier League at the moment. Close and close to Sheffield United, they'd both be probably battling it out for the worst attacking teams in the league. Across the back line, we've got Udogi at home to Fulham, Cash at home to West Ham. That will be a difficult game for Cash, but I'm hoping that he can get some attacking returns out of it. Burn at home to Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace do not look at all like they are attacking very fluently. Um, there's some key injuries in the team there, and so I am hoping that Burn could come away with a clean sheet or maybe even another attacking return. He did score in the Champions League game um, last week, which is great to see. So I think Eddie Howe is finally exploiting the massive height difference that he has got in that Newcastle backline. I mean, Sharp, Botman and Byrne are all really tall players that can definitely win a majority of the headers, especially on set pieces. So here's hoping we get lucky with one of those. And Buomo is, uh, this will be his last fixture for me in the squad. He's at home to Burnley, which is probably the best attacking fixture in terms of whip, whipping boys. Burnley are trying to play football. They are trying to come out and attack, and that will leave holes around the pitch. So I'm hoping that Mbumo can come away with something there. Madison at home to Fulham. Luis Diaz at home to Everton. Sun also at home to Fulham. Salah with the vice captaincy at home to Everton. And both Julian Alvarez and Haaland up front at home to Brighton this weekend with the captaincy on Haaland. Benches Johnston away to Newcastle. Kabore away to Nottingham Forest. Baldock at home to Manchester United, but it is injured. And Woodrow last on the bench, who is basically not playing. So the fixture swings. Uh, where are we here? So by game weeks. Let's just go down to the next four game weeks starting from game week nine so this is my own personal fixture ticket that i have built uh we've got it ordered by the next four game weeks so from game weeks 19 11 and 12 best fixture runs at the top of the list works worst fixture runs at the bottom but it is an extended view so you can see the fixtures pass the four fixtures that we have ordered by You'll see up the top here, we've got Aston Villa, Liverpool, Man United, Arsenal, Brighton, Spurs, and West Ham. Now, all of these teams are, well, Liverpool, United, Arsenal, Brighton, Spurs, you would expect to be vying for the top four spots in the league. Manchester United will be nowhere near that come the end of the season. They are a bit of a banana peel team for this upcoming fixture run. Aston Villa, usually in and around fifth, sixth, seventh spot. Uh, similar to West Ham, who will be pushing for those uh, Europa spots this season. They look like they have strengthened and have a great team behind them. So these are some very, very key teams with some very good upcoming fixtures. And we need to make sure that we do jump on the correct teams and the correct players from those teams. Because if we get this wrong, there are going to be some very hefty game point scoring weeks in FPL over this next run of four fixtures as West Ham, Spurs, Brighton, Arsenal, Man United, Liverpool and Aston Villa look like they could come away with a lot of goals in this upcoming fixture run. So the banana peel teams that I have got listed here. So out of those seven, is it seven teams? Five, seven, yeah. Out of the seven teams, I've got three teams down as 
probable banana peel teams in which you could slip on them and go tumbling down the ranks. Now for this run of four or five game weeks, we need to prioritize nailed on assets. Now at the beginning of the season, I was quite happy to go with a rotation prone player in Jao Pedro. And the reasons I was happy to do that is there weren't really too many other strikers in that spot that I was worried about. I was more than happy for uh, Jao Pedro to come in off the bench the end of the match uh, as he will be attacking quite well in those fixtures but the 90 minute men from these top seven teams that you see on screen could come away with absolute monster hauls across 90 minutes and so any rotation prone player will only be extremely lucky to be able to match these 90 minute men now if the best run of fixtures was teams like Fulham, Sheffield United, Everton, Luton, Burnley. I wouldn't mind at all going with rotation prone players because there is, you know, all the good teams have hard games and so they will not be scoring as many points. But for this run of fixtures, we need to be nailing down those players that are making the full 90 minutes and not prone to rotation. And so the first team on the banana peel list is in fact Brighton. Now Brighton are rotating low like crazy and I do not see it stopping anytime soon. They made a massive amount of changes uh, for that fixture against Liverpool. They had Solly March playing at left back. That was more of a forced move because excuse me um, Stupinan and um, Lamptey were both injured and out for the fixture and so they played Solly March in at left back who did okay it's obviously not his position of choice uh, but they also started uh, the youngster is it Belieber I think is the name who had an amazing game in the middle of the pitch I've never seen him play before he's caught me off guard I didn't realize that he was even in the team but to start their first game up against Liverpool I think it was his first match, is a huge ask from De Zerbi, and he is just showing that he is going to rotate that squad very heavily. Now, the most nailed on player for minutes looks to be Matoma, but even he is getting rotated. And if it's if last season is anything to go by, so at the end of last season last year, Brighton had the worst fixture congestion schedule at the end of the season. Matoma was benched on multiple weeks, uh, game weeks towards the end of the season, and it could very easily happen again this season. And so even though they've got, uh, after game week nine where they play Man City, they've got Fulham at home, Everton away, Sheffield United at home, and Nottingham Forest away, those are four super plum fixtures, but I have no idea who is going to be starting every single one of those matches, and so I think I am likely going to swerve Brighton for the fixture block. Now, I may, in fact, jump on a Brighton asset for maybe a one-week punt if I need to at some point, and I can predict who the likely starter is going to be. But at the start of the fixture run, I just want to put in a nailed on player that's going to play all four or five of the next matches in case any injuries crop up. And so I think Brighton could be a bit of a banana peel team and I will be avoiding them. Manchester United, I watched their fixture at the weekend. Great to see them uh, clutch a victory from... Uh, well, from the death, really, we looked incredibly disjointed throughout that whole match. They still have not got it together. Um, I will not be investing in Manchester United, even though they see they will be against Sheffield United, Fulham, so Sheffield United away, Fulham away, Luton at home, and Everton away in the next five fixtures. Those are definitely fixtures where Manchester United could turn their season around, but it would just be a hope that they are going to use those fixtures to turn the season around. There is no guarantee of that. They have been playing pretty poorly all season, 
and I think there are other teams that are just playing much better football with much better assets that are more likely to return points across this fixture run and so I am still hard recommending and a, recommending a hard avoid on the Manchester United assets and the final banana peel skim team oh, Jesus <laughs> banana skin team is West Ham now West Ham's fixtures in game weeks 9 and 11 are actually very tricky. They're away to Aston Villa and away to Brentford. Now, Aston Villa and Brentford have actually been playing very well so far this season. So have West Ham as well. And I do not think West Ham is a bad team or could cannot win these games. They could easily beat these teams. They could beat them by a couple of goals as well but they could just as easily lose those games and lose those games by a couple of goals. And with Spurs, Arsenal, Liverpool and Aston Villa having shown that they're playing really good football and have really good opponents, I think assets from all of these teams will probably outscore the West Ham assets the West Ham assets that I'd only really be considering here would be Jared Bowen and James Ward-Prowse. I don't think it's worth jumping on any of the defensive assets, as I think Aston Villa and Brentford will likely score. Even Everton may sneak a goal against West Ham as well. Uh, and I think even though James Ward-Prowse and Bowen could score um, goals and come away with some pretty good returns in these fixtures, if they in do f fact slip up, I think the likely, the best candidates from Aston Villa, Liverpool, Arsenal and Spurs will just continue to return across the coming game weeks. And so Liverpool, Arsenal, Spurs and Villa are the key teams to target. So we'll start with Liverpool. I've already talked quite a bit about Luis Diaz. I still think he is the best attacking option besides Salah in that Liverpool team and I have heard Nunez being floating floated as an option around the community but he is not at all in my thoughts unless I am taking a very short term punt uh, because I think there are just better options available I would put Ollie Watkins as much higher up the list than Nunez as he's a much better finisher and a more well-rounded footballer than Nunes. So watching Nunes in the Liverpool fixture at the weekend against Brighton, I can see why he is such a devastating player. He is amazing at using his body positioning and strength to gain advantage over his opponents. That's what makes him so good at beating his man which ends up generating some pretty chaotic dynamic attack as he does this very rapidly and the game just shifts with the ball at his feet. He's also got great vision and will play his teammates into great effect. If you look at that first goal from Salah at the weekend, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Great first time pass, well weighted, perfectly into the path of Salah so that he had the perfect body shape to sink a very easy shot for any clinical finisher. Thank you, Harvey Elliott, for stepping over that ball. I think he recognised that he wasn't quite <coughs> shaping up to hit that ball well, and he was aware that Salah was behind him. Super happy that he jumped over the ball, as that was obviously a very easy finish for Salah to sink. But the downfalls for Nunez are that his shot selection is severely lacking. It seems to me as though once he gets into a good sh shooting position, he realises that he's in a really good shooting position and kind of gets a bit flustered or excited and just, I don't know, the calmness of his assists shows that he's got awareness and he can read the game well enough but when it comes to a shot he just doesn't select the right shot for for the situation that's faced him instead of using his side foot to you know place it past the pe the keeper like far post or whatever you'll often see him lacing it with power 
which is way less control and direction. It was a shot that he tried to take at the weekend with his back to goal when he had quite a few opponents that he could have just laid the ball off easily to. He will be an extremely frustrating asset for any owner in FPL, as I suspect he will continue to maintain some very good expected attacking numbers, but he will have a very poor rate of conversion. I think that's what he ended up with last season, and I do see that continuing, as I don't is still making pretty poor choices when it comes to shooting. So, on the Liverpool front, Diaz uh, will just exclude Salah because obviously Salah, 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 but Diaz would be top of the list, then followed very closely by Robertson and Trent. Now, Trent is completely unachievable in my setup, so he is not even in my thoughts. And similarly, Robertson down at 6.5 million is also basically out of reach too. Uh, but I thought I should bring him up for any of you out there that may be holding on to someone like a Trippier. Uh, he could be a very sly switch to from Trippier across to Trent, uh, sorry, to Robertson, uh, as Liverpool's fixtures of Everton at home Nottingham Forest at home, Luton away, and then Brentford at home. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that for Liverpool. I think they will probably keep three clean sheets in four in that run of fixtures. And the way in which uh, Diaz and Robertson work together on the left side of the pitch, I can see Robertson coming away with a few assists in this run of fixtures. So not for my team at all, but... Uh, definitely some assets that could be um, brought into different structures of teams out there. Now, I would love to hold on to Diaz for this run of four fixtures, but I will be buying Saka back as quickly as he is available and that I think that he is over that injury. If I could somehow get hold of an extra 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 million... With the 1.1 million in the bank, I could jump from Mbumo up to Saka, which would be a midfield of Saka, Madison, Diaz, Sun, and Salah. I mean, that would just be amazing. But 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 million is a hell of a lot of money to find in my team. I'm also already extremely light on the bench, and there are not too many places that I could, in fact, downgrade. It would have to be Udogi, Cash, or Johnston, and I do not think that those sacrifices are actually worth holding on to Diaz to accommodate Saka alongside him. Uh, but if you have some way to get Diaz into your team, potentially in place of Madison, who is now up at 8.1 million, it's huge gains since the beginning of the season. I brought him in for game week one at 7.5 million. He has just continued to go up. And if he is starting to get out of reach, you could look at Luis Diaz as a bit of a differential as opposed to Madison. So the teams there that I mentioned were Liverpool, Arsenal, which is mostly just sucker for me. I'm not looking at any other assets from the Arsenal team. Spurs, I am already tripled up on, and so it just leaves Aston Villa. And Aston Villa is the main team that I do not currently have, which I desperately need cover for in attack. Yes, I've got Matty Cash in my team, but the attack for Aston Villa across this next four game weeks looks like the team that could decimate my rank if I do not get this right. Now, the game in game week 9 against West Ham at home, very tricky fixture for Aston Villa. God only knows which way this game is going to go. It could be a nil-all, could be a two-all, could go either way. Um, I am not too worried about missing out on Aston Villa in game week 9, but for that run of Luton at home, Forest away and Fulham at home across game weeks 10, 11 and 12, I 100% need an Aston Villa attacker in my team. Now, I still rate Alvarez as a better asset compared to Watkins, but Watkins scares me. 
Here's the only asset in the game that I don't own that I currently fear and I have no easy way to get him into my squads. Into my squad, sorry. Don't know why I plural that. Into my squad. So, uh, and last year Watkins actually hurt me badly when everyone went to sell Haaland uh, for that blank. They jumped on Watkins for three games. I held on to Haaland. Haaland then got injured across the international break and so I had an injured Haaland in my team and Watkins just continued to score across his double and single game and I lost a huge amount of rank as a result. I know Watkins can continue to do that and I am a little bit worried about him. So the only way that I can jump onto the Aston Villa attack is to go with one of their midfielders. As I've mentioned in my videos last week, I am looking to go from Mbumo up to Diaby uh, in game week 10 after Mbumo has that really kind fixture at home to Burnley this week. And I am just crossing my fingers that Diaby manages to keep pace with Watkins as I think he can cover some of the points. Diaby can score goals. He can, he will be, or he does play very centrally and so he will be very close to Watkins and will hopefully be assisting uh, any of the goals that Watkins does come away with. But that is quite worrying for me. Watkins is probably the main player that I do not own. I cannot easily get to. Uh, and he does, in fact, scare me a little bit. So that's my thoughts on the upcoming fixture swing. Uh, obviously, my current plan is to roll the transfer in game week 9 so I can make a double change in game week 10, probably bot going Mbumo to Diaby and Diaz back up to Saka if Saka is indeed back fit. But this is assuming that there are no key injuries to any of my assets across the international break. The main asset that I am actually worried about is Sun Hyun Ming, as he will almost certainly excuse me he will almost certainly play uh, for Korea across the break and if he is flogged in that match he could provoke whatever injury it is that he is nursing and that Postacoglu has been nursing by subbing him early in all these fixtures I do not at all know the South Korean team very well or the manager I have no idea what's going to go on there but I imagine that Sun is their best player and he will probably be used as heavily as that manager thinks he can be and so I wouldn't be surprised to see a flag come on Sun across the international break and he is probably the main player that I am currently worried about. So make sure that you don't make any early transfers, wait until all the international matches have been played and we can make some decisions next week which will be when I am back with the next video. So that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed this video and got something out of it, press the like button and consider subscribing. And if not, and if not, that's all good too. I appreciate you watching. Cheers.